when we we do uh, author forums here, we usually ask our own uh, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap to do the introductions. So, sir, if you would. Our guest this morning is Claude Barabee, a friend of mine for I don't know a long time, and now he's abandoning me. He's moving off to to Maine. He's a uh, a man of mystery. He's a spy. He's an instructor. He's a history professor. He's a naval officer, just retired, PhD in history from some British place. Um, and he's, he's got a new book out. Uh, he's got several novels that he's written are very good. And I'll let him tell the story, but Rick over Uncensored, it, he got access, Paul got access to the papers of Hyman Rickover. And anybody, I'm a, a Navy brat. My dad was, was in the Navy. And uh, there, we got a lot of stories. Uh, I heard a lot of stories about Hyman Rickover, um, and they were all entertaining. Uh, so, welcome to the show, Claude. So, tell us about your your journey and and the book. Well, thanks for having me. And I think it was appropriate that you started off with Jim Morrison and the Doors. I don't know if you know this, but Jim Morrison's father was an admiral, a Navy admiral, uh, Admiral yeah. George Morrison. Uh, the uh, genesis for this was actually a dinner I was at in D.C. I was at the Army-Navy Club with some friends, and an admiral I knew called me over, a retired admiral. He said, hey, Claude, I want to introduce you to some people. And he says, oh, this is, uh, this is uh, Ollie North, my old friend from the academy, Colonel North. And this is Eleanor Rickover. And Eleanor Rickover was the second wife of Admiral Hyman Rickover. They married in uh, 74, I think it was. And very nice. We uh, had several chats. She invited me over to the condo that they shared in Arlington several times, had tea and cookies with her. Um, and I asked her, well, how did you meet Admiral Rickover? She said, well, he was in Bethesda, and I was a Navy nurse at the time. And I walked into the room, and there were all these newspapers strewn all over the room, and I was very upset. So I yelled at him, and I told him he would never, ever do that again, and he should clean up his own mess. And the next day, it was clean, and he asked me on a date. <laughs> so I think it was because she was the only person who stood up to, to Admiral Rickover. Uh, so she, before she passed, she bequeathed her, the entire collection of Rickover materials, including his, his, one of his congressional gold medals, his Rolodex, which was phenomenal, but 250 boxes worth of his personal papers, which included letters to his first wife, daily letters to his first wife in the 1930s, transcripts of telephone conversations, um, memoranda for the record, so every time he had a meeting, he would write a memo about it so he could recall, but also for, the, for history. And it's just a phenomenal history. So what I did is I spent about six months in the archives going through every one of those boxes and figuring out what, it, what shows Rickover as in a different way. Give us, for the audience who doesn't know who Hyman Rickover was, mm -hmm. Why is he significant? Why was he significant? Hyman Rickover is known as the father of the nuclear Navy because after World War II, he is the one who is assigned to uh, look at po nuclear power for our ships. And he is in that position for more than 30 years as naval reactors until his retirement. He's forced to retirement in uh, early 1982. Uh, but he's really an American success story. Uh, this is somebody who, at five years old, emigrated from what is now today Poland as a Jewish emigre, had nothing. I mean, there, her, his mother bought an orange once a year when she could afford it for the family. Uh, that's what it was like. So he moves to Chicago, gets a, gets a nomination to the Naval Academy, and from there on in, he is unstoppable, a voracious reader, and... I don't think it when during his time, I don't think many Americans didn't know who Rickover was. Uh, he was on the cover of Time magazine. He had the media in the palm of his hand. Everybody was coming to him for interviews. He could choose who to say yes and no to. And that's not common, especially among, uh, you know, senior military. Uh, he was very, very close to senior members of Congress, which helped his career. In fact, he was passed over for Admiral the first time. And several senators and congressmen wrote to the Navy and said, you know, we think you should have another board to determine whether or not he is of value. And sure enough, they decided, oh, yeah, well, sure enough, look at this. He's an admiral now. Uh, and that continued on through his career for his second, third, and fourth star. Yeah. Uh, w 
any of us that were in the Navy, and I think a lot of other folks as well, knew Rick over by the many, many, many stories. But he was always shown as a crusty, mm -hmm. it's got to be done my way, and anybody that wanted to get in the nuclear forces uh, uh, had to have a personal interview with Rick over. And the, the, the results of the interviews were legend. And they just were le folks left in tears and were totally deflated. But mm -hmm. yet your book paints him a different way. Yeah, for those who aren't aware of these famous interviews that everybody in the Navy seems to know, yeah. uh, he would do things like saw off a part of a chair, tell the interviewee to sit in the chair and see how they would react, or he would nail shut a, a window and then tell them, go open that window, it's, it's too hot in here, and see how they would react. He wanted people to be honest with him. And if you could do that, you passed. Uh, and there's one story about uh, uh, someone said, make me mad, and tell, pick up that story. <laughs> uh, yeah, Rick over told him, how, how would you make me mad? And, and he, the, the midshipman wiped everything out of his desk, took his boat model, and smashed it against the wall. And he said, okay, you made me mad. You, you're <laughs> now in the nuclear power program. <laughs> You know, maybe we should start that around here on Monday morning. Good <laughs> well, job, we win. <laughs> Pour water on the control board. And then, uh, <laughs> that would make Rodney mad, which would then make Mike mad. Yeah, so he'd win on that one there. Uh, how long did it take you to write this book, Claude? You, you know what? I chose not to write it as a biography. There have been eight or nine biographies of Rick Over, so it didn't take as long. The, the key was the research. What I did is turn this into an edited volume of his papers. I wanted Rick over to speak for himself because as a, about two or three months into the process, I came across a, a memo that he had in talking with a journalist and he said, you know, I don't want another biography written of me. I don't want you guys making movies of me, which Hollywood sometimes did if they wanted to. And he said, I have all these papers that I've collected in my apartment and maybe someday somebody will put them into a book. And I said, that's it. I'm going to let Rick over speak for himself. I am not, I'm going to remove myself as a historian and evaluating him. Instead, I'm going to put what I think are the most important parts of his life in there and, and let him speak for himself. And that's why I, I think this is preferable to some of my other books that I've written in terms of naval history, is that the character is the book. What is the most revealing of the papers that you found about him as a man? So much. Uh, the compassion. And, you know, the Admiral mentioned that, you know, he was known as a very acerbic, abusive person uh, many times. But I saw these elements of compassion. In 1937, he's in command of a ship in Shanghai as the Chinese, uh, uh, the Chinese are being invaded by Japan. And he's on the street, walking on the streets and rendering aid and giving coins to people who are literally dying on the streets. I think the most poignant letter that I came across, uh, there was a nine-year-old kid who had written to him from California named Hyman. And he said, you know, Admiral, uh, my mother says your name is Hyman too. And do you get mad when people make fun of your name? And how do you deal with it? And Rick Over didn't always re return letters. But in this case, he did. And he wrote a beautiful letter. You know, this is what the name Hyman means. And, you know, this is how you should treat people. And at the end, he signed his name, Hyman G. Rickover, and it took me aback because in all six months, I had never seen him sign his name other than H.G. Rickover. So here he's having empathy for a young child. Uh, his, all of his book, sorry, all of his speeches that he did, anything he, he did to make money, all of that went into uh, organizations, you know, orphanages back at the time, or UNICEFs, places that could help people. So mm -hmm. I think his compassion is, is, is something that's that's been missing throughout all biographies. One of our Facebook commenters asked, do you know the story when Rick Over visited Jimmy Carter's office? Uh, n several times, actually. He was there in the book. There's there are a memorandum for the records from several meetings, not only there, but in the condo. Uh, <laughs> there's about a 10-page memo that he writes after his hit that dinner. Apparently, Rosalind Carter and El Eleanor Rickover had met and Eleanor invited them over for dinner at some point. So one night, Rickover gets home, and there's five plates at, at the dinner table. And he says, what's this? She said, oh, we're just having some guests over for dinner. And the bell rings, and the door opens, and it's President Carter uh, and, and Rosalind and Amy. So they, uh, they had dinner, and you know exactly what was discussed. And I kind of feel bad for President Carter. I think he wanted, like, a night off. Instead, 
Rick Over is just peppering him with all these issues. And uh, but it's it's really an interesting relationship between Rick Over and Carter because Carter was one of those midshipmen who was interviewed. During the interview, Rick Over said, "Did you do your best at the Naval Academy?" And he said, "No, sir, I didn't." And he said, "Why not the best?" And so Carter, when he becomes a nominee for president, that's his campaign slogan, why not the best? So he got it from Rick Over. They, they had a very close relationship, and so there are a lot, there's a lot of correspondence between the two in this book. There's another uh, naval, ad, naval admiral uh, that had difficulty working through the system, working with the peers, and had to uh, have Congress intervene, and that was Admiral Grace Murray Hopper. Uh, and I'm sure you're very familiar with uh, with Admiral Hopper. Yeah, you know it's it's odd. Uh, I had a student ask me if there was anything in here about Hopper, and I found nothing, no communication mm. with Hopper. Who's uh, I remember her from a David Letterman uh, interview mm. back in I don't know what eighty five, eighty six. I was in college, uh, and she was hilarious, but also a brilliant yeah. woman in and but not except for cyber. But not accepted by our peers. No, and very similar to what Rickover was. Very similar. Yeah. Um, the yeah, right. Rickover is 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 an entity unto himself. There will never be another Rickover because you won't have somebody who's in the position for thirty years. You won't have somebody who is so tied to Congress that uh, he could call the ball on any hearing. He had something like over two hundred appearances before congressional committees. Today. You might have an admiral, a senior admiral who is there for maybe 10 or 20, depending on, on what their position is. Uh, is that I, an engineered thing these days? or it, It's very controlled, but they knew they couldn't control Rickover because Rickover was so close to Congress. He was so close to Congress, in fact, there was a chairman of a, a appropriations committee who did not want to see any other member of Congress. He had a, a slate of about a week where he didn't want to talk to anybody. So one member, one junior member said, called Rickover and said, would you call the chairman for me? I really need to meet with him. So Rickover called the, con the chairman, and the chairman said, sure, Rick, send him in. And he got a meeting that way. That would never happen today. Everything is controlled through Office of Legislative Affairs. But also, Rickover is a very controlling individual mm -hmm. as well. And there are stories that the, uh, uh, some of the nuclear application was on research ships. The research ships were not under Rickover. Therefore, Rickover was, took great offense at any, any work toward nuclear research vessels in the Navy. Yeah, that's true. And the other admirals were also offended that he was trying to get into their rice bowls. Yeah, yeah. And he, especially with education, uh, and he would testify not only on nuclear power, there was, a, there was congressional testimony on campus unrest. I was just reading this yesterday. And, you know, we have campus unrest with the pro-Hamas uh, protesters around the United States. And he's testifying in 1969 about the campus riots and protests. And he says, look, here's what you do. All these colleges and universities get money from the government, and all the students are getting money. If they do something illegal in the course of their protest, cut the money off. That's all you do. Cut, the off, cut off the universities, cut off the, the protesters from their money, and then... That's fine. He didn't oppose legal protesting. It was whatever illegal actions they would take. So 30 years branches, <coughs> excuse me, branches multiple administrations. Mm -hmm. So with all of this power, he did, did he sort of neuter various secretaries of defense and Navy and just... All the time. And that, he bypassed them. He would send memos directly to the president, especially when Carter was president. Now, he knew Nixon when he was president because he had known him. He had gone on a trip to the Soviet Union in, when Nixon was vice president. He knew Gerald Ford when he was a congressman. So again, the, the advantage of Rickover serving for so many years is he got to know them before they were in those key positions. And the secretaries of defense and secretaries of the Navy were not happy. Uh, SecNavs often tried to uh, get him retired even in the late 60s, early 70s. And each time that would happen, he would go to the president or to Congress. Again, it would never happen today. By the way, the Hopper appearance was November of 1986 okay. on Letterman. I just looked it up Thanks. while you were pretty good. Pretty good memory. Doing, yeah, no, it's not a memory. I looked it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would have been 23 at that time, and I was watching a lot of Letterman back then. So yeah, and going back to these 
famous or infamous interviews of someone wanting to, a young officer wanting to get into the uh, uh, to the nuclear program. Let's tell such stories it, as uh, Rick Over invite someone for uh, for lunch, mm -hmm. and if the individual put salt on his food before he tasted the food, he was out of the program. And that I don't doubt that. Yeah. But also, these were only oral histories. We, yeah. We've all heard these stories over the years. And I, I remember the day I opened a file and there was a transcript of one of the interviews. I said, oh my God, this, this, is, this is actual, this actually happened. And there were probably 12 or 13 more around there. There may be more. And you see his thought process behind this. He's not the nuclear engineer interviewing these people. He's asking about their English courses at the academy. Tell me about what poet you read. When did they live? He's asking them about humanity's side because he, he later says in, in an interview, I don't care about the, the STEM, I shouldn't say he didn't care about the STEM programs. I want somebody who understands the humanities because I can train them to be a nuclear engineer. I can't always go the other route. So doing something like this, you really get to know the man mm -hmm. I would, and, at a different level. So would he be happy that you've poked through the hard crust and shown the world his soft underbelly? I think so, because I don't think he would have kept all the letters from Ruth. Ruth was his first wife. And he, he said when she died in 1972, I would, would not be the man I am today without Ruth. He respected her as an intellectual superior, and he always supported her. She was one of the first, he met, they met at Columbia. She was, I think, the first woman in the United States to earn her doctorate in international relations. So what you see in these daily love letters to and from Ruth, first of all, these, some beautiful language which Rickover is using with her, you know, the, the love, truly love letters, but also all the things that they're re all the books they're reading together wherever they are or when they go see an opera or play or he's reading uh Karl Marx or Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf and I'm I'm reading I'm like wow and he's not reading Mein Kampf to agree with it he's trying to understand the German mindset in the 1930s but he was also wrong sometimes there was a a letter he writes to Ruth in the 1930s where he says, I just read this article about this new atomic energy research. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we've got about a minute and a half sure. left, Claude. Um, is there anything that didn't make the cut for the book that you wish in retrospect you had put in? Uh, no, I I think that this only represents probably 0.1 of 1% of all the material. So what I say uh, in all my interviews and even at the end of the book, I hope there are historians uh, who look at this because there are easily another dozen books books uh, about Rick Over and against Rick Over Uncensored. Mm -hmm. One more quick question. Mm -hmm. Of all, the, you've written several books. Mm -hmm. uh, is this, would be this, would this be one of your favorite books because it's taken a different tack? Yes, uh, because I yeah. really understood the individual yeah. in this case. And I've written two other, one biography and one semi-biography, mm -hmm. but in this case I understood somebody much better. Yeah. Where can we find the book, Claude? Uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any, anywhere you get books you can order them. And will you be doing anything uh, in terms of personal book signings or anything like that in the near future? N not in the near future. I'm trying to pack up my house and move to my new house up in Maine. <laughs> so, uh, not this, not for the next month or so. Watch for the moose. I understand that they're pretty big up they, that way. They are very large. Yeah. Good to see you. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks. And at uh, 957.